As the dawn grew brighter, we withdrew from the window and went, very quietly, downstairs. The artilleryman agreed with me that the house was no place to stay in. He wanted to rejoin his regiment in London. My plan was to return at once to Leatherhead. We lined every available pocket with packets of biscuits and slices of meat. Then we crept out of the house and ran as quickly as we could down the ill-made road by which I had come overnight. In the road lay a group of three charred bodies close together, struck dead by the heat ray. Here and there were things that people had dropped. A clock, a slipper, a silver spoon. On the corner, turning up towards the post office, was a little cart filled with boxes and furniture. It was horseless, heeled over on a broken wheel. A cash box had been hastily smashed open and thrown under the debris. Even the birds were hushed. As we hurried along, the artilleryman and I talked in whispers. Every now and then we looked over our shoulders. After a time we drew near the road, and as we did, so we heard the clatter of hooves. We saw through the tree stems three cavalry soldiers riding slowly towards Woking. We hailed them and they halted while we hurried towards them. You are the first men I've seen coming this way this morning, said the lieutenant. What's happening? The artilleryman jumped down the bank into the road and saluted. Then he began a vivid account of the heat ray. They're giants in armour, sir. Hundred feet high, three legs, and a body with a mighty great head in a hood, sir. Get out, said the lieutenant. What nonsense! It's perfectly true, I said. Well, said the lieutenant to the artilleryman, go along and report yourself to Brigadier General Marvin. Tell him all you know. He's at Weybridge. Know the way? I do, I said. He rode on and we saw them no more. By Byfleet Station, we emerged from the pine trees. It was calm and peaceful under the morning sunlight. Some of the houses were deserted, and we heard the movement of packing in others. A knot of soldiers were standing on the bridge over the railway. They were staring down the line towards Woking. Several farm wagons and carts were moving creakily along the road. Suddenly, through the gate of a field, we saw, across a stretch of flat meadow, six artillery guns. They were standing neatly at equal distances. Farther on towards Weybridge, there were more soldiers, all staring over the treetops southwestward. Byfleet was in tumult, with people dressed in their Sunday best, packing wagons, and soldiers on foot or horseback trying to get them to clear the area. We saw one shriveled old fellow with a huge box arguing with a corporal. The old man had a score or more of flower pots containing orchids and didn't want to leave them behind. I stopped and gripped his arm. Do you know what's over there? I said, pointing at the pine tops that hid the Martians. Huh? said he, turning. I was explaining. These orchids are valuable. Death, I shouted. Death is coming. Death. I left him to hurry after the artilleryman. At the corner I looked back. The old man was still standing by his box with pots of orchids on the lid of it and staring vaguely over the trees. I had never seen such confusion as there was in Weybridge. Carts and carriages everywhere. No one could tell us where the headquarters were. We saw, as we crossed the railway bridge, that a growing crowd of people had assembled in and about the railway station. The platform was piled with boxes and packages. We remained at Weybridge until midday, moving then to the place where there was a ferry across the river. Here we found an excited and noisy crowd of people 
carrying heavy luggage. As yet, the flight had not grown to a panic, but there were already far more passengers than all the boats going to and fro could enable to cross. Across the Thames, except where the boats landed, everything was quiet. The people who landed there from the boats went tramping off down the lane. The big ferry boat had just made a journey. Then the sound again, this time from the direction of Chertsey, a muffled thud, the sound of a gun. The fighting was beginning. The firing was across the river to our right, unseen because of the trees. A woman screamed. The sudden stir of battle was near us and yet invisible to us. We could only see flat meadows and cows feeding unconcernedly in the warm sunlight. Then suddenly the ground heaved under our feet and a heavy explosion shook the air, smashing two or three windows in the houses near and leaving us astonished. Here they are, shouted a man in a blue jersey. Do you see them? Look! One, two, three, four of the armoured Martians appeared. They were far away over the little trees across the flat meadows that stretched towards Chertsey. They were striding hurriedly towards the river. Little figures they seemed at first, going with a rolling motion and as fast as flying birds. Then, advancing obliquely towards us, came a fifth. Their armoured bodies glittered in the sun as they swept swiftly forward, growing rapidly larger as they drew nearer. One on the extreme left, in a huge case high in the air, was the ghostly, terrible heat ray. It fired towards Chertsey and struck the town. At the sight of these strange, swift and terrible creatures, the crowd near the water's edge were for a moment horror-struck. There was no screaming or shouting, but a silence. Then a hoarse murmur and a movement of feet, a splashing from the water. A woman rushed past me. The terrible heat ray was in my mind. Get under water, I shouted, unheeded. I faced about again and rushed towards the approaching Martian, rushed right down the gravelly beach and headlong into the water. Others did the same. A boatload of people came leaping out as I rushed past. The stones under my feet were muddy and slippery and the river was so low that I ran scarcely waist deep. Then, as the Martian towered overhead, I flung myself forward under the surface. The splashes of the people in the boats leaping into the river sounded like thunderclaps in my ears. People were landing hastily on both sides of the river, but the Martian machine took no more notice of the people running this way and that than a man would of the ants in a nest against which his foot has kicked. Half suffocated, I raised my head above the water. The Martian was on the bank and in a stride wading halfway across. Six guns on the right bank fired simultaneously. A shell burst clean in the face of the thing. The hood bulged, flashed, was whirled off in a dozen tattered fragments of red flesh and glittering metal. Hit! I shouted with something between a scream and a cheer. The decapitated colossus reeled like a drunken giant, but it did not fall over. It recovered its balance and drove along in a straight line, incapable of guidance. It struck the tower of Shepperton Church, smashing it down. Then it swerved aside and collapsed with tremendous force into the river, out of my sight. A violent explosion shook the air, and a spout of water, steam, mud and shattered metal shot far up into the sky. 
a huge wave like a muddy tidal bore, but almost scaldingly hot, came sweeping round the bend upstream. I saw people struggling in the river and heard their screaming and shouting faintly above the roar of the Martian's collapse. I splashed through the tumultuous water until I could see round the bend. The fallen Martian came into sight downstream, lying across the river, and for the most part submerged. Thick clouds of steam were pouring off the wreckage. I could see the gigantic limbs churning in the water and flinging a splash and spray of mud and froth into the air. The tentacles swayed and struck like living arms. A man knee-deep near the towing path shouted inaudibly to me and pointed. Looking back, I saw the other Martians advancing with gigantic strides down the riverbank from the direction of Chertsey. At that, I ducked at once under the water and, holding my breath until movement was an agony, blundered painfully ahead under the surface. The water was rapidly growing hotter. When for a moment I raised my head to take breath, I saw them dimly, colossal figures of grey magnified by the mist. They had passed by me and two were stooping over the frothing, tumultuous ruins of their comrade. The air was full of sound, a deafening and confusing conflict of noises, the clangorous din of the Martians, the crash of falling houses, the thud of trees, fences, sheds flashing into flame, and the crackling and roaring of fire. Dense black smoke was leaping up to mingle with the steam from the river. I stood there, breast high in the almost boiling water, hopeless of escape. I could see the people who had been with me in the river scrambling out of the water through the reeds like little frogs hurrying through the grass. Suddenly the white flashes of the heat ray came leaping towards me. The houses caved in as they dissolved at its touch and darted out flames. The trees changed to fire with a roar. The ray flickered up and down the towing path and came down to the water's edge not 50 yards from where I stood. A huge boiling wave rushed upon me. I screamed aloud and scalded, half-blinded, agonised. I staggered through the leaping, hissing water towards the shore. I fell helplessly in full sight of the Martians. I expected nothing but death. I have a dim memory of the foot of a Martian coming down within 20 yards of my head and then of the four carrying the debris of their comrade between them through a veil of smoke and then very slowly I realised that by a miracle I had escaped.